Okay, let's turn to our last um, sensory system in the course. Any announcements from TAs? Are there any TAs? No, there are no TAs. Um, I think you can pick up your midterms, but I don't know the details. I think they will be available in the section. Okay, so let's go with that. Midterms will be available in section, i.e. tomorrow, and um, there is the uh, plot of the distribution of uh, scores available as well, and of course you'll get your own uh, score on the midterm once you get it back, and so you can compare yourself to the rest of the class and uh, calibrate yourself and see where you fall. If you have questions uh, about how you're doing, uh, let your TAs or uh, Henry or myself know that. Any other announcements? Uh, we don't seem to be having any TAs. Uh, any other announcements? Problem sets? Oh, John, any announcements? Okay. Uh, midterms, they're getting in t tomorrow in discussion section? Okay. Okay. So, somatosensory sensory system. The last uh, sensory system after having gone through olfaction and vision and audition. I guess that's it. Uh, so we'll do the same thing that we did, uh, uh, or very similar to the other sensory modalities. We're going to um, look, in this case it's a little more complicated because um, somatosensation is more than one thing, but uh, we will start at the periphery, we will ask what are the receptors that transduce touch into electrical potential changes, action potentials in the case of the somatosensory system. Um, where do they project next? What are the second order neurons? What are the third order neurons? Eventually, how does that information end up in primary somatosensory cortex? And what are some basic principles? And as you will see, they're very similar to what we saw in the case of vision and audition. So we'll walk our way through that. Uh, and then we'll spend a little bit of time at the end also briefly talking about pain, which is similar but also different from discriminative touch. So we come back to this picture here that you've seen many times from Sherrington's classification of uh, different sensory modalities. And um, so first off, it's worth pointing out that there are um, a number of sensory modalities that we don't have time to go into in the course. Uh, you should be vaguely aware of them, and if we've mentioned them briefly in passing, uh, you might know a little bit more, but we won't expect you to know anything in detail. For instance, you heard about our sense of balance, the vestibular system, briefly when we talked about the auditory system, but I wouldn't expect you to know where that projects centrally and so forth. Uh, there are other very interesting ones. Uh, there's taste, which we haven't spoken about. There's electrosensation, which we don't have, uh, but weakly electric uh, fish do and use in order to find their way around and find other animals. And there's uh, a magnetic sense that some birds, like homing pigeons, uh, use, for instance, to navigate around that we also don't have and about which it's probably the only sensory modality about which we really don't know uh, how, it's, how it's transduced and how it works. It's clear that if there's something like it, um, that there is magnetoreception, but we don't know a lot about how it works. Or even whether humans have it, there's some debate about that. At any rate, so with respect to somatosensation here, it's worth pointing out that it maps that sensory modality consists of multiple sensory modalities and it maps onto three that are shown here in Sherrington's scheme. One is proprioception, which is the sense that you have in the location of your limbs in space. So you know where your limbs are located in space, both by looking at them visually, but you, you also know in complete darkness where your hands and your feet, etc., are. And at least part of that comes from proprioception. Extraception is the main one we will focus on today and what people typically think of when they think of the somatosensory system. So this is touch on the surface of your body. So that's an example of extraception. And then there's introception as well, which is typically not accessible consciously, but is also an example of somatosensation in that it is information about the body. So somatosensation in general, and your book makes this point as well, consists of multiple modalities that are at range from extraceptive to proprioceptive to introceptive. Okay, so here's the question for you guys. Um, anybody want to take a stab by analogy to what we had with vision, what we had with audition, where we asked the question, what is seeing, what is hearing, what is feeling? What do you want to guess? What would be the default answer? You should know that by now, even though you might think it's wrong. What's the answer to this question? 
Somebody. Yes, Olivia once again. <laughs> okay, good. So that would be the an analogy from vision and audition, right? It's active, touch things, and you want to know what they are and where they're located. And certainly that's one function of somatosensation and the function of, um, of discriminative touch to some extent. Now, you might think this doesn't apply to everything. So for instance, feeling pain doesn't quite seem to map onto that answer, and that uh, shows the point that I was just making, that somatosens this doesn't have an answer because somatosensation is not one thing. It's multiple things. So take-home message number one is that somatosensation consists of multiple sensory modalities. Some, like discriminative touch, have an answer similar to the one that Olivia gave, and some, like pain, don't. Uh, at this point, you want to make uh, comparisons between all the different sensory modalities that you've heard about. We did a little bit of that last time. And we'll do it now between the three that you've heard about, audition, vision, and touch. It's worth asking yourself how olfaction might fit into this scheme as well. It's quite different from the others in many respects. Uh, good question for an exam or a problem set. So we had this slide up before. As, is, as was the case with vision and audition, there are different processing streams. In the case of touch, these are quite clearly distinguished already at the periphery, at transduction. So there are different receptors for pain, for temperature, for different types of touch, and those project differently centrally and specify different processing streams. So different processing streams specified uh, at the periphery already. There are topographic maps. There is a somatotopic map of the surface of your body for touch, just like there was a retinotopic map of the receptor epithelium, the uh, retina in the case of vision, an atonotopic map of the receptor epithelium, the cochlea, in the case of audition. So in all of these three cases, you have topographic maps that are also already <coughs> specified at the periphery. There are maps there in terms of just the spatial relationships of the receptors on your body. As was the case with the other sensory modalities, there's distortion and magnification so that that part of your body that you, uh, about which you process the most information and where you have the highest spatial acuity has the greatest cortical representation, uh, your face and your hands in particular. There's lots of inference involved to uh, make inferences about touch from, uh, from the receptors, comparisons like surround inhibition we will see, very similar to what you saw in the other sensory modalities that serves to, uh, to provide contrast and sharpen the tuning of neurons. Uh, just like in the other systems, there's feedback everywhere, and you can imagine being touched. These two down here have been studied in great detail in the somatosensory system. They're very important plastic periods, uh, not just in development, but also people have studied this, for instance, in people who have a hand or a finger amputated. Uh, and you will find that the cortical territory in the primary somatosensory cortex that would normally represent that digit gets taken over, over time, by uh, representations of the adjacent fingers. So there's lots of plasticity here. Um, and this varies. This is, there's also interesting stories in comparison with other animals. And it's important in social communication. You might not think so, uh, but you know, shake anything from just a handshake or a hug, uh, like how you greet people in different cultures, to close interactions with a loved one or between a mother and an infant. And you see this in many animal species as well. So we have two cats at home. Uh, as far as I can tell, their main uh, channel of social communication is touch. They come up to you and they rub. Uh, and same with one another. So it served an important role. These aspects, the social communicative aspect of touch, uh, its role in development have also been studied in relation to the what, what happens if you deprive mammals of touch. So touch is extremely important in the development of infant mammals. So they're always with their mother. They're typically being groomed by the mother. If you take that away, uh, you end up in severe, uh, with uh, severe problems in the development of those animals, and animals ranging from rat pups to uh, monkeys and humans, where, of course, you don't do experiments like that, but people have observed this. So anyway, all the same themes that we had for the other sensory systems also apply to the somatosensory system, and here we had a table um, making some comparisons between audition and vision before, and now what we would like to do is to add in somatosensation to this table. Here it is. So let's just go through this. Um, so you know from previous lectures that transduction is extremely fast in the auditory system, and it's, that there's phase locking up to about 4 kilohertz or so, so very high temporal fidelity. 
by, the, by contrast, vision, because at the transduction stage, it's, it depends on second messengers, it's very sluggish in time, and that's one reason why you can see movies. It's fusion if you have uh, temporal uh, things coming quickly. In the somatosensory system, it varies. And you have, you can detect vibration or flutter that has fairly good temporal acuity, not nearly as good as the auditory system, but still it has better temporal resolution than the visual system. By contrast, there's some aspects of somatic sensation, like a dull, aching pain, that are very slow and that last for a very long time. So there's a big range uh, in line with the fact that the somatosensory system consists of all these different channels that I mentioned to you. So temporal acuity has a range. Spatial acuity, same thing. Um, and as I mentioned, it varies depending on where on the surface of your body you're talking. You have much better spatial acuity, like two-point discrimination, on your hands and your face than you do on your back, just like you have much better spatial acuity in your fovea than you do in the periphery in the case of vision. So feedback, remember there was feedback to the cochlea, massive feedback in the case of the auditory system, none at all to the retina. And there is feedback to the spinal cord uh, that's very important in the case of the somatosensory system. This is, for instance, involved in modulating ascending information about pain. So pain is very subjective, and it may feel very bad, or it may not feel so bad, and at least part of that effect already takes place by top-down modulation, feedback down to uh, neurons in the spinal cord that will modulate uh, ascending pain information, for example. It's somewhat active, um, and then there's various specializations here. Uh, the receptor numbers are intermediate, so if you look at receptor numbers in the auditory system, remember this was really small, in fact only about 3,000 inner hair cells per cochlea, tiny, compared to the huge number of photoreceptors in vision, about 100 million. So metasensory, how many receptors are they located on the body surface? About 100,000 or so, so it's sort of intermediate. And if you wanted to add olfaction to that, that would be about 6 million of olfactory receptor neurons. So there's big differences in the number of receptors. With vision, the highest, audition, surprisingly small number, and somatic sensation and olfaction intermediate between these. Any questions uh, about these comparisons between sensory systems? So again, these, are question, these kind of comparative questions uh, are ones we like to ask on problem sets and exams, so make sure that you know these. You don't just want to know information about one sensory modality and all the little facts about that that you read in your book, but you want to, um, you want to make sure that, uh, uh, that you can make comparisons between these as well. Okay, so what happens in the somatosensory system as you go on up to cortex? So remember that for all of the modalities, with the exception of olfaction, there's an obligatory relay through the thalamus, Somatic sensation is no exception, so we have information from the skin, as was the case in the auditory system. From the skin, there's information that goes to a variety of places, in the, what goes to the spinal cord first, and then on up um, the brainstem, and only then to the thalamus. So again, if you wanted to make analogies, you could say that the spinal cord levels of processing that you have in the somatosensory system, just like the midbrain, uh, the brainstem nuclei that you have in the auditory system are sort of functionally serve a purpose similar to all the processing that you have in the retina in the case of vision. And only after that do they give their information to the respective thalamic sensory nuclei, the lateral geniculate nucleus for vision, the medial geniculate nucleus for audition, and then the ventral posterior lateral and ventral posterior medial nuclei for somatosensation. And you can take a look at your book to figure out uh, the to make sure that you know the names of those and roughly where they're located. But the, the main point is there are specific sensory nuclei in the thalamus for each of these three sensory modalities. And then that information from the thalamus is relayed on up to primary cortex, primary somatosensory cortex, which you remember from the first lecture where that is. We'll take a look at it more in a minute. Okay, so let's look at the pathway. This is a very, very simplified version. We'll take a look in more detail in just a minute, of the pathway for discriminative touch. This is called the dorsal column medial lemniscal <coughs> pathway. And very, uh, the simplest possible uh, version of it is outlined here. There are uh, more complex paths. This is not the only path forward. But if you wanted to ask, 
what's the fastest way, what's the minimal number of synapses to get from the skin to primary somatosensory cortex. That's what this shows you. So there are receptors in the skin for touch, many different kinds that we'll take a look at. The cell bodies of neurons for those are located outside of the central nervous system in the peripheral nervous system in dorsal root ganglia. That's where all of the sensory, the cell bodies of all the sensory neurons are located. And then their axons project into the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, they course on up through white matter tracts, and then eventually they get to the brain stem, they synapse there onto second order neurons. So right away you can see that these first order neurons can be very long. They can have receptors in the skin, and then they can project all the way up to the brain stem with their axon. So that's a pretty long neuron, and only then do you have the second order neurons. Those then project on up to the thalamus, and then the thalamic sensory nucleus projects on up to cortex. Okay? Each of these has receptive fields, as I mentioned, and so there is somatotopy that is specified already at the periphery, and to some extent the magnification, the overrepresentation in this somatotopy of certain parts of the body surface, those parts that you can discriminate with the best, like your fingers, like, like your hands and your face, arises from the density of receptors on those portions of your body. And so it's just schematized here, you would have a spatially restricted receptive field of one of these dorsal root ganglia neurons here, just because of where it sits spatially in the skin. And then if you record it from this, you would find that this neuron would fire action potentials only if you touch the skin near that surface, but not elsewhere. One big distinction here between this sensory system, somatosensory system, and audition and vision, uh, that should be apparent already, but just to make it explicit, is because these first-order neurons are neurons that have long processes, remember in vision you had very short photoreceptors, in audition you had very short hair cells, those had graded receptor potentials, not action potentials. Here in the somatosensory system, the first-order neurons, the receptor neurons, already fire action potentials, because they need to get stuff from the skin into the spinal cord. That's a long distance. So that's a big difference between those three sensory modalities that wasn't in the table, but that you should make sure that you know. Okay, so the neural code that we spoke about before in the case of the auditory system also applies here. The rate of how many action potentials a neuron fires encodes the intensity of the stimulus. The harder you push on a piece of skin, the greater the action potential rate of the neuron. Where they are located, the place, the particular axon that's coming into the brain tells the brain from where, where on the body, it is encoding information. So this is sort of a place information. And then the type of axon that is coming in, whether it's coming in from a temperature sensor, a pain sensor, or a touch sensor, that tells the brain what the kind of submodality of the somatosensory input is. Okay, this is just been, so one important thing is that because there are these submodalities, pain is not just very intense touch. So it's not as if you have the same receptors and it's just after a threshold when they reach a certain rate of firing that you convert touch to pain. Instead, what happens is that the touch neurons have lower thresholds and they're firing in a dynamic range up to a certain point of pressure. And then if you really push hard where it starts getting painful, you start recruiting different sets of receptors that have higher thresholds, and those are the ones that convey pain to the brain. Of course, these would overlap to some extent, but it's important to note that they're separate sensory submodalities that span the dynamic range. It's not all encoded just by differences in rate of a single one. Um, okay, we'll take a look in detail at the different types of receptors here in a minute. Okay, so for touch, here are four Oh, sorry, for the somatosensory system, here are four main um, submodalities then to think about. There's discriminative touch, and, and that consists of not just one, but several different kinds of receptors. We'll take a look at them in a minute on your skin. There's proprioception. This is information that often has to do with somatosensory receptors that are located in joints that give you information about the orientation of limbs in space. There's pain, which is, again, consists of multiple different channels but is separate from, from these up here and projects to separate places to some extent centrally. And there's temperature sensation. So these are all different submodalities of the somatosensory system. And as I mentioned, each of these consists of different receptor subtypes. So it's much more heterogeneous 
already at the transduction stage uh, than was the case with vision or with audition. And then you can add interoception, which is information about the internal state of all, all your body organs as well. Typically, these up here, to some extent, are, to, to a large extent, are modalities that contribute to your conscious experience of somatosensation. This one here, in general, not. Your brain gets information from the body through interoception. Most of that is used for homeostatic regulation and not, uh, it, not part of your conscious experience. In terms of just discriminative touch, which is the one we're going to look at in the most detail, um, there's uh, these four different uh, uh, things that you can do behaviorally, and they're subserved by uh, different sets of receptors. So you can localize fine touch on different parts of your body. You can discriminate two very closely adjacent points. This is just like um, spatial frequency tuning in the visual system that we looked at. And there, you can get itching or vibration or flutter sensations, again, from specialized receptors. And you can do this here, which is similar to the question that Olivia answered at the beginning. This, is, this allows you stereognosis means figuring out the three-dimensional shape of objects by palpating them. So you can, if you close your eyes, you can figure out what something is by just touching it. That's complicated. It requires many receptors and a lot of inference uh, centrally. Okay, so this just mentions what I said. Let me finish here with this figure for now. Um, so this illustrates uh, for uh, touch the main receptors that you want to know about. And take a look at your book for more detail. So these four. Meissner corpuscles, Merkel discs, Pacinian corpuscles, and Raffini endings. And then there are also these free nerve endings that have to do mostly with temperature and pain sensation. But so this gives you a, an overview of uh, uh, several, not all, but several of the different types of receptors in somatosensation and a little bit of information about where they're located. So the skin is up here. In addition to this, you would have hair follicles coming up um, that also have receptors on them. Where these are located and the particular specialization. So you'll see these all have weird little... Uh, schematics on them, the particular specializations of these uh, end organs here uh, determines what submodality of touch it is that they are responsible for transducing. So for instance, Pacinian corpuscles way down here get highly uh, spatially filtered input because they're fairly down, far down over the skin, so they're not great for two-point discrimination, and they're interested in vibration and flutter kinds of sensations. Okay. We're going to take a break here for, like, let's say, seven minutes or maybe ten minutes. And John's going to hand out a quick quiz to you, and then we'll resume uh, looking at the rest of this. Let me, so don't turn it over yet. Let me know, or I'll ask you in a minute if you all have one. Write your name on the first page, as usual. Okay, let's pick up where we left off. Okay, so um, this table here just gives you a list of some of the sensations that are produced if you microstimulate some of these receptors that we just saw. Let me just go back to the slide here. Some of these receptors that we saw here uh, individually. And so you would never get this normally, of course. So normally the, the sensation that you have of touch will activate always multiple of these receptors. And so the conscious percept that you have is some, something very complicated that reflects the relative strength of input from all these, uh, all these different ones. And just to say a little bit more here again, these are all specialized in terms of the nerve endings here. Depending on what the specialization is, it will, it will transduce mechanical stimuli in a certain way um, and where it's located on the skin. If you want the highest spatial resolution, you need to have receptors that are closest to the surface of the skin, as you might imagine. So you want it really close up here, so when you push down with a pin or something, there would be some deflection that this receptor could detect. So this one down here, for instance, as I mentioned, Pacinian corpuscle is poorly suited for good spatial resolution. It cares about deep, sort of vibrating kinds of things coming in, but it can't tell if that's coming from this location or an adjacent location because of the spatial filtering of the overlying tissue. Okay. Any questions about the basic 
scheme, the fact that there are these four types of receptors that you want to know the names of that are up here. And here are some of the uh, sensations that would be evoked by microstimulating them. Uh, so this tells you a little bit about what they do. So uh, if there's some kind of a flutter, vibration, tapping, that's what these Meissner corpuscles transduce. The Petrinian corpuscles are extremely good at picking up even fairly fast vibrations, or your sense of tickle if something is vibrating, like a tuning fork, uh, but they're poor at spatial resolution. Uh, Merkel discs are better at spatial resolution, but care more about sustained pressure. So the way they're located on the skin, uh, how quickly they adapt, and what the specialization of the receptor ending is in terms of its temporal resolution, all of these contribute to the particular aspect of touch that they feed in. Ruffini endings are concerned, um, they respond sort of to stretch, and they're concerned more with knowing where in space your limbs are located. So if you move your fingers around on your hand, knowing where they are, uh, that's what these signal, and they do so uh, together as an ensemble. So you typically, if you just stimulate one, you actually evoke no conscious sensation. And then there are these ones down here that you don't want to stimulate, if possible, that will evoke sensations that are, that are related to pain. Okay, so, and again, different types of pain. Uh, there's a sharp pain, there's a duller, burning kind of pain, cramping pain. So all the different flavors of touch and of pain and of temperature, for that matter, are conveyed by different kinds of um, uh, receptors here. Uh, this just says the same kind of thing. Why am I not moving forward? There we go. Okay. Um, here's an example. You can actually see these uh, just barely with the unaided eye of a Petrinian corpuscle that we saw in the slide uh, a little distant, little a couple of slides ago. So this is like a layered onion. There's lots of layers in here in which are interspersed free nerve endings. And if there's some kind of shearing input, like a vibration, it will shear these layers and the free nerve endings get stimulated. So this particular receptor specialization uh, is, uh, is specialized to transduce vibrating uh, kinds of stimuli up to about 100 hertz. And then there would be an axon from here that again fires action potentials that would go into the spinal cord uh, from these uh, receptors. There are many nice things you can do uh, in a lab, in an experiment, to take these receptors and record from them, and you can shear them using all of these different kinds of uh, devices that are shown here that will make these cells swell, or you can pull them, and you can measure how mechanical deformation results in changes in the receptor potential, and an example of that is shown here. So if you put a mechanical probe on and you poke one of these, and you record the currents as a function of the strength of the deformation, it's exactly as you would expect the current gets larger and larger, the larger the deformation. And then, of course, that uh, will translate into different rates of action potentials that are then transmitted centrally. So here's, um, this kind of walks you through in a little more detail what we just had. So you have the psychological properties that these, that these particular receptors are responsible for. And how does that work? Uh, so it has to do with the threshold at which these neurons fire. Some, like pain, pain receptors, would require a very high threshold. They, only, they don't respond if you just touched lightly. They respond if you have you know, a pin prick or something that's really harmful coming in. And they have different rates of adaptation. So some are very fast and some are very slow. And that's uh, schematized here. So here are the different receptor subtypes listed at the top. The kind of stimulus that would be best for activating uh, that receptor subtype. Here's like a little picture of where they are. And then this is the kind of response that you would elicit. And these um, somewhat cryptic things here, RA means rapidly adapting, SA is slowly adapting, and you can tell that by just looking at the discharge rate of these receptor neurons. LT is low threshold, which is what all of these are, and HT over here on the right is the only one that's high threshold, that's the one denoted by a hammer, so that's your pain uh, receptors. And here's just the strength of the stimulus. Uh, here's what their spatial receptive fields are like. And this is the perceptual, uh, uh, the, the percept that would be evoked if you stimulated these. OK, so it's a nice comprehensive table. Just walk your way uh, through this um, and make sure that you know it. And this will give you an idea of how, where 
these are located in the skin and what kind of specializations they have relates to the kind of action potential pattern that they transmit and how that is related to the particular psychological uh, aspect of touch or pain that they contribute to somatosensation. Any questions about this scheme? Again, the most important thing to know is there are submodalities and these are subserved by particular very specialized receptors. And the kind of specialization, where they're located in the, in the skin, whether they're high threshold, low threshold, fast adapting, slow adapting, accounts for their particular properties. Okay. In terms of more central processing, you have very similar, uh, in many respects, very similar computational themes as what we saw in the visual system and the auditory system. So there's sharpening to sharpen contrast by center surround mechanisms that depend on both feed forward and feedback inhibition from adjacent receptors. I think I can probably just skip through these. You can take a look at them. This will look extremely similar, identical to the picture that we had up in the visual system where we were talking about spatial frequency tuning. So remember that the basic idea is that you have some receptor uh, that in isolation would not be particularly sharpened, but it is sharpened by a broader inhibitory input from adjacent neighbors. And that's just shown here. You have the same thing on the skin. So if these project centrally, as is shown in this kind of complex scheme up here, showing feed forward and feedback inhibition, you would sharpen the spatial receptive field of this sensory neuron here shown in the middle because it is inhibited by its neighbors. Okay? So it's very, very similar to mechanisms that you find in the other sensory systems, and, the, and this shows the same kind of thing. Uh, that, yeah. So any questions about that, center surround inhibition? Okay, so let's walk our way through the two main pathways that you need to know and memorize are these two shown here. So make sure you understand uh, this slide and where these tract, these white matter tracts go, because the details of them make very specific predictions about what would happen, what deficits you would have, if you had a lesion, like a transection of the spinal cord, at a particular location. So let's just go through this. These, the one we talked about so far is the one here shown on the left. This is called the dorsal column medial and miscal pathway. This is for discriminative touch, everything we've spoken about mostly so far. You have receptors here in the skin, uh, these dorsal uh, dorsal root um, neurons here, they project into the spinal cord. They do a lot of stuff in the spinal cord, so we're not saying much about what happens in the spinal cord here, but there's a lot of processing that happens within the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. There are different layers there, they get different kinds of inputs, so there's lots of processing. We don't have time to go into it, but they these neurons, these first-order neurons, do make synapses in the spinal cord. Some of them go up, some of them go down, there's lots of interneurons, lots of processing. We don't talk about that because we don't have time. But one other thing that they do is they don't synapse in the spinal cord where they enter, but instead they run in white matter tracts on up the spinal cord for a long distance. And this, these white matter tracts are called the dorsal columns. Okay, so just again to reorient you, here's the spinal cord. Up here is dorsal, down here is ventral. Inputs, sensory inputs come in dorsally, and the outputs to, uh, to, motor, uh, to nerves from motor neurons are down here in the ventral part. Inputs at the top, outputs at the bottom. Okay, so these big white matter tracts here are the dorsal columns, and at least a good portion of the sensory input that comes in from these first order neurons, their axons run all the way up the spinal cord until they make up here in the medulla, they synapse onto these second order neurons whose cell bodies sit in these dorsal column nuclei. And only then do they cross to the other side of the brain. And then they go on up to the thalamus, BPL, BPM, and then they go to somatosensory cortex. So if you had a stroke, and you had a lesion up here in primary somatosensory cortex, I would have you tell me that you would then lack touch sensation, you would be unable to have numbness or wouldn't be able to feel something on the opposite side of the body, corresponding to that part of the body that is topographically, topographically represented at wherever the lesion is in somatosensory cortex. We'll take a look at that in a minute, but remember the, the body surface is represented topographically on primary somatosensory cortex. But if this is right somatosensory cortex, you have a big lesion, you would be unable to feel stuff on the left side of your body. By contrast, 
If you have a spinal cord lesion here on the left side of the spinal cord, if you have any section of the spinal cord on the left, you would lack touch sensation below the level of that lesion, also on, this, oops, on the same left side of the body. Okay? Does that make sense to people? So walk your way through this. It's fairly straightforward once you know it, but you need to know it. Depending on the level at which you have a lesion, whether it's at a particular point in the spinal cord or whether it's further on up here, that will have consequences on which side of the body you will have deficits on. That's for touch. That the medial lemnis that's the dorsal column, that's these white matter tracts, medial lemniscus, which is this tract that crosses pathway. That's what it's called. For touch. For pain, it looks different. And so for pain, what happens is that the input is similar. So we have these free nerve endings that are very high threshold, and they encode pain sensation. And again, the cell bodies sit, sit here. The information comes into the dorsal spinal cord. So all of that looks similar to touch so far. But then they don't run on up in these white matter bundles all the way up here to synapse. Instead, they cross already at that same level in the spinal cord. So they've crossed. They don't need to cross again. And then they run up the spinal cord, and then they go eventually into many places, but amongst them primary somatosensory cortex. Okay? So if you had a lesion in primary somatosensory cortex, you would lose touch and pain sensation on the opposite side of the body. But if you had a lesion in the spinal cord, the consequences for touch and for pain would map to different sides of the body. So if you have a lesion in the spinal cord here, say, then you would lose uh, pain sensation on the opposite side of the body, but you would lose touch sensation on the same side of the body. Okay? Any questions about that? So walk your way through this. These, these, these things are important to know, and certainly if you uh, ever want to become a neurologist, they're essential to know. Um, uh, and they, they relate to where these pathways uh, course. Okay. Let's take a look at uh, somatotopy in a little more detail. So this is for the touch system now. Again, the dorsal column, medial, and miscal system. The different nerves, we have this picture on up, uh, one of the, I think the first lecture or so, second lecture. Um, so that where nerves come in and give information about the body surface into the spinal cord uh, relates to that segment of the body that they innervate. So somatotopy is defined by in part where these come in, and so you can map the different nerves, the different cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral nerves, onto these so-called dermatomes, which are the regions of the body that are innervated by those nerves. So if you cut one of these nerves, if you have a pinched nerve at one particular location, you will have some pain or numbness or some altered somatosensory input from a particular segment of your body, because that's the segment of your body that's innervated by the receptors running in, whose axons run in that nerve. Okay? Is that clear to people? You will notice that the face is, uh, isn't colored here, and that's because input, uh, touch input uh, from the face doesn't go into the spinal cord. So every part of your body, all the somatosensory input goes in through these spinal nerves here, all the way on up here, but then it stops, and actually the first, actually C1, uh, doesn't get to give you input from the face, but it gives you input from the meninges, those membranes that cover the brain, which have pain receptors, unlike the pain, un unlike the brain itself, but not the face. The face, face touch information comes in through the trigeminal nerve, which is a cranial, one of the cranial nerves. So even if you have a very high section spinal cord transection, so if your spinal cord is cut way up here, you're going to be in a wheelchair and you're not going to be able to feel anything on all of your body, with the exception of your face, because the face information doesn't have to go through the spinal nerves, it comes in through the trigeminal nerve. Okay? Um, as I mentioned, the somatotopy is uh, relayed on up, so it comes, there's particular regions on your skin that are innervated by particular spinal nerves. As those enter the white matter here in the dorsal columns, that somatotopic arrangement is preserved. And of course, as you start down in your legs and you keep going on up the spinal cord, you're going to add more and more axons as these upper parts of your body contribute information. So these dorsal columns get thicker and thicker the higher on up you go, and they preserve the somatotopic mapping so that the arm is more lateral, 
and the lower levels, like the legs, are most medial, where they come in first. And then this just shows the rest. They go on up, and then you have a somatotopic representation on the body. And as I mentioned, the head uh, gets information from the trigeminal nerve. So this is just the scheme again. Let's take a look at cortex quickly. So you remember from one of the very first lectures that somatosensory cortex is in the anterior parietal lobe, in the post-central gyrus. Here it is. And this is called Brodmann's area. There's actually several psychoarchitectonically distinct regions, each of which has a separate map of the body surface. Brodmann's areas 1, 2, and 3 are the same as the post-central sulcus, which is the same as the primary somatosensory system. Just like we had the calcarine sulcus being the same as primary visual cortex being the same as Brodmann's area 17. So, so that's where it is. And then just like with the other sensory systems, you have higher order somatosensory cortices that represent more complex aspects of touch, like particular uh, psychological aspects of touch, and that begin to combine it with other sensory information like vision. So if you put electrodes into primary somatosensory cortex, they only care about touch. If you put electrodes back here in the posterior parietal cortex, they can be driven by touch, by vision, and they have more complicated properties related to attention, for instance. Here is the somatotopic, uh, somatotopic representation of your body surface on primary somatosensory cortex. So it looks just like this, and it shows you, also we can just uh, plot the um, magnification of somatotopic representation onto a small so-called homunculus that represents the body surface that would look like this. Uh, so what this represents, the larger these regions are, the more th uh, the size of these different body parts corresponds to the size of their cortical representation in primary, somatos primary somatosensory cortex. So this just makes the point that I made earlier. The receptor density and your ability for two-point discrimination are all greatest on certain parts of your body, as you would imagine, the hands and your lips and your face, and you and other animals, many other animals, would explore the world primarily with that. So if you want to, you know, figure out something or you want to read Braille, you're not going to rub your torso <laughs> over that, but you're going to use your fingertips because they have much better resolution. Um, if you look in other animals, so there, there are lots, as you might imagine, of specializations relating to the particular behavior and the way in which particular different animal species explore the world through touch that map onto this. Probably the best studied one is in many animals, but not in you, they have whiskers on their face. So in rodents, for instance, they have whiskers and they explore the world not exactly on their face, but very close to their face with those whiskers. And as you would imagine, those whiskers are overrepresented in somatosensory cortex. In fact, they're very specialized, and there's a part of somatosensory cortex for mapping the whiskers in rodents that is called barrel cortex, because each whisker is represented by one little barrel. And people have studied those in, in great detail in that particular model system of somatosensory processing. There's lots of plasticity. Um, roughly, it's uh, as you would imagine, and as I briefly mentioned to you, People have done this experimentally in monkeys, and they've also looked non-experimentally in humans, who, because of an accident, had an amputated finger or arm or something like that. And what you find is that normally there is a somatotopic representation up here, for instance, that would represent a digit that then was subsequently uh, removed, amputated, either experimentally or through accident. And what happens over time, so this uh, happens in various stages over time, is that other cortical territories from the adjacent digits take over that tissue that used to represent the digit that is now no longer there. Where the, there are lots of work on the mechanisms by which this happens, uh, and they have, uh, the mechanisms occur at multiple stages of processing, some at lower levels and some at cortical levels. Some are relatively fast and some take years, but that's, uh, that's what happens. Um, we're going to run out of time here in a second. So let me skip these. This is not really too important. Let me finish with pain. So this, again, just take a look at this. This just schematizes or summarizes the two main pathways that we already spoke about, that you want to know about. The one for touch, shown here on the right. The one for pain, shown here on the left. And pain is much more complicated than touch uh, because it projects to many more different central targets. It's much more distributed in its representation. 
and that's shown here. So if you have an injury here, you have pain information coming in. Remember that this cross is already in the spinal cord, unlike information for touch. And then they're ascending white matter pathways here, the anterolateral system, uh, on the opposite side of the spinal cord from where the input came about the pain. There's lots of processing internal to the spinal cord, as I mentioned. So there's lots, it's not as if the spinal cord is just a relay. It's very complicated, lots of processing in the spinal cord that we don't have time to go into, but that's what's schematized by these little layers here. And then it projects to many places. So pain information projects to places in the brain stem, in the thalamus, and multiple cortical targets. One of those is primary somatosensory cortex. So you do get pain information to somatosensory cortex, it's topographic, and so in general you know roughly where the pain is located on the body surface. But in addition, it feels bad, and it may feel very bad or not so bad, the different flavors of pain, and those emotional and motivational components are represented not in primary somatosensory cortex, but in other regions that are shown up here, like anterior cingulate cortex and insular cortex. So this, uh, to some extent, relates to the theme that we saw already reiterated in the first slide, that there are different processing streams. Not only are there all these different submodalities that we talked about, and these two big streams for touch and for pain, but in addition, for pain, different aspects of pain, like where it is and how bad it is, are represented in different cortical targets. Okay. Um, in addition, one thing just to mention to close on is that there is massive feedback down to lower levels. This does a lot of complicated things, but in the case of pain, it's very important. That's shown on the right here. So there's feedback from many regions, and in particular these regions in the periaqueductal gray, that project back down, all the way down to the spinal cord. And so they are in a position to gate the ascending information about pain. Uh, some of the neurotransmitters that these neurons use are endogenous peptides that bind to the same receptors that opiates, like morphine, bind to. And indeed, they serve the same function. They're analgesic. And so whether or not a stimulus is painful can be psychologically modulated. You can have a very painful stimulus, like, say, childbirth, that cannot feel so painful because it occurs in a very happy context. People have done studies where you can hypnotize people so they feel less pain. In all those cases, there is descending information from higher brain regions that reaches all the way down to the spinal cord and that modulates how pain is transmitted in the spinal cord and passed on up. Uh, this is just a picture of some of the, uh, the precursor proteins from which these endogenous peptides that I alluded to, these endogenous opioids, uh, are, uh, are made. There's a whole bunch of them. They're all derived from very large uh, initial transcripts. These are enkephalins, endorphins, and again, they bind to opiate receptors. In the last slide, just to make uh, a point about how complex uh, pain is, so it has multiple channels, multiple cortical targets, and have many different flavors of pain. And that shouldn't surprise you because there are a zillion different things that can induce pain. And so here's a free nerve and a nociceptor. And if you ask what makes this thing fire, well, there are many different things. So there could be some noxious chemical. There could be inflammation and the re local release of histamine. There could be pressure and shearing. So you want mechanically gated channels, like this trip channel shown here. All of these different uh, transduction mechanisms are going to be represented in this nociceptor and across different nociceptors. So it's extremely diverse. So it's, it's, again, it's very different from what you would find in the rest of somatosensation. And it's very different from what you saw with photoreception or um, auditory hair cells. There are many, many different kinds of receptors that care about chemicals, that care about inflammation, that care about mechanical shearing. All of those things can signal harm, local tissue harm. So the, the, the distal causes are very diverse, but they all are bad. And so you all want to transduce them into pain. And so that's what's illustrated uh, in this last slide. OK, so that's the end of sensory systems. Uh, think about them, maybe go back and review what you've heard uh, in the, it, about vision, olfaction, audition, somatic sensations, so you can make comparisons. Uh, on Friday, we're going to move on to talk about learning and memory. Where did you get that last slide? Uh,